I'm really, really pleased to be here this afternoon. I'm going to start by saying um, I've discovered at this age that I'm suddenly allergic to tree pollen. So I'm uh, having some allergy issues. So um, I'll try not to cough into the microphone, but that's, uh, that's what's going on with me. Um, so um, I'm the fourth speaker in the series, and I'm really pleased to... Um, Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have a couple, but thanks. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm just I'm delighted to be here. And um, I'm also, as we all are, trying to push into some new territory and work through some um, different ideas. So I welcome your um, input and feedback and conversation this afternoon. So um, the title of my talk is Exceeding the Material, an Ontology of the Collective. So I begin with a quote from Claire Colebrook. Oh, maybe that didn't work. OK. My slide's not advancing. It was working earlier. Oh, all right. But then I tried it with the computer, and it didn't work. Should I hit the space bar? I think you might have to use the keyboard. And push well, I tried it, and it, right and left, yeah. yeah, and that didn't do anything. Maybe I can do this. So what we'll do is we'll. There it went. Like okay. That. All right. So I'll do that. All right. So, um, take two. This is sort of par for the course of this trip, isn't it, Natalie? <laughs> I can tell you all more about that later. Um, all right. So I begin with a quote from Claire Colebrook: "To refer to materiality is to go beyond what is simply given." the thing as it is named or predicated, and to consider the process by which it comes into being or actuality. <clears throat> My work in theorizing is concerned with questions of what we do when we do this thing we call qualitative inquiry. For some, this conjures ideas of doing field work, which means understanding social processes in context, in the field, as it were, through participant observation, interviews, and document analysis, to name a few common field methods. Through my own research and that of others, I have become interested in the problem of how qualitative researchers limit that which constitutes voice to that which can be listened to, understood, or made sense of as a result of some of those methods. And I've written about this um, extensively in my work with Alicia Jackson and in the edited book that we produced together. In other words, voice in traditional inquiry is that which can be attributed to a rational, individual, humanist subject one with a body that we can know and name. It ascribes to a conventional view of empiricism. That, <clears throat> excuse me, and this is a, a quote from Elizabeth St. Pierre. That the contents of our minds, our consciousness, and the source of knowledge of real existence, existence independent of thought, must be derived from and justified by sense-based observations of experience. Primacy of sensation, then, the given, what is, is the source of our ideas, of knowledge. In other words, we cannot claim to know anything not given in our experience. Speculation about what might be cannot be a criterion of truth. In this way, empiricism is not only a theory of knowledge, but also a methodology. As I wrote with Elizabeth St. Pierre and Alicia Jackson, empiricism and materialism go hand in hand. In classical empiricism, knowledge of the empirical world gained through the senses is the only knowledge that is legitimate. Um, I'm in a college of education that adheres to that much of the time. <laughs> um, what of that which escapes the senses? The argument is that we can't claim to know anything not given in our experience. Speculation through logical reasoning is just that, speculation, and cannot serve as a ground for knowledge. Matter, in other words, that which counts as data that can be observed through the senses and captured as evidence, surely matters in classical empiricism. However, matter in the classical sense is generally assumed to be a fixed substance, brute, inert, and passive, to be used by agentive humans, but not with vibrancy of its own. <clears throat> the empirical and the material are so enfolded they must change together. 
And with those changes comes a rethinking of, an, of ontology, which considers the nature of being and the basic categories of existence, subject, object, essence, appearance, substance, quality, identity, difference, we could name some others, as well as the nature of human being. As we rethink matter, we must rethink the empirical about knowledge and ontology about being. Um, and this is where new, new materialism comes in, is that it's not just human being. <laughs> um, and the classical division between the two begins to break down. Hence Barad's concept, ontoepistemology, and another even more indicative of this new work, ethico-ontoepistemology, which makes it clear that how we conceive the relation of knowledge and being is a profoundly ethical issue, as is the relation between the human and the non-human. <clears throat> What troubles me still, however, is that in the context of inquiry or materialism and even new materialism, there is still matter in some form to be accounted for. What are we to do with that which exceeds the material? In the context of this seminar and speaker series in new materiality, I wish to focus on Colebrook's distinction between the material and materiality further to stretch how we might think about what constitutes materiality with a heightened curiosity and accompanying experimentation. <clears throat> and I know some of you are doing that in your own work now. And in so doing, to attend to the way in which to consider a naming of the new. Following that, I will present an ontology of the collective um, using the problem of voice as my, as my illustration. Um, and what such excess of voice, of materiality, of corporeality, of inquiry makes possible? So, what is the new, or how am I thinking about the new? <clears throat> Brian Masumi, excuse me, let me take a drink. <clears throat> Brian Masumi explained that by definition, the new cannot be described, having not yet arrived. What then counts as new? Who decides? And how new does work have to be to be considered new? How do new scholars even know if their work is new? Um, just last week on Facebook, a new scholar who just got her PhD, I know, uh, posted, new materialism isn't new, for which she received many likes. I could have responded, I could have responded by quoting Stacey Alamo and Susan Heckman or Myra Hurd and how these authors and others distinguish the new materialisms from the materialism of Marxism and or 20th century material feminisms. In so doing, they stress the different assumptions about agency and the subject essential in this new work as it differs from reactivations of materialist traditions prior to modernity. Instead of whipping off this response, I assumed instead that this scholar was referring to an assertion that my indigenous, and I know in, in Canada it's First Nations, in the U.S. it's indigenous, that my indigenous students and colleagues make that the concept of matter itself as lively or as exhibiting agency is not new in their thinking and being and those of their ancestors, both familial and intellectual. In eschewing a categorization of the new as marking and ordering of thought, <clears throat> Colebrook wrote, in suggesting that the new of new materialism should not be seen as a chronological marker where new materialists correct the simplicity of radical feminists like Firestone and then the cultural turn of feminists like Butler, I am not in turn correcting a narrative and then offering my own as the proper series of events. Rather, I am hoping that the ways in which we think about materiality will be that the very structure of the concept creates curious before and after effects. It is important to recognize that whatever we wish to call the current turn, the empirical turn, the material turn, the ontological turn, and others, are possible because a different image of thought in which everything has turned, an image of thought in which the old categories and distinctions can no longer be thought. An ontological reorient reorientation shared in this new work, influenced by the work of Gilles Deleuze and his vitalist proclivities, the work of Karen Barad and other feminist materialists that you've been reading that conceive of matter as lively or as exhibiting agency, Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy, which is sparking other social scientists toward a process methodology and speculative empiricism, and the work of Michael Marker, Eva Garot, Vine Deloria Jr., and other indigenous scholars who provide examples of knowing inseparable from being. The 
ontological commitments of new materialisms provide concepts for understanding, this is quoting from um, Stacy and Alamo's um, uh, introduction to their edited um, collection. The ontological commitments of new materialisms provide concepts for understanding the agency, significance, and ongoing transformative power of the world. Ways that account for myriad intra-actions, in Karen Varad's terms, between phenomena that are material, discursive, human, more than human, corporeal, and technological. Why does this different understanding of matter and material matter? Varad explained that only in this ongoing responsibility of the entangled other, without dismissal, without enough already, is there the possibility of justice to come. Entanglements are not intertwinings of separate entities, but rather irreducible relations of responsibility. There is no fixed dividing line between self and other, past and present and future, here and now, cause and effect. Quantum discontinuity is no ordinary disjunction. Cartesian cuts are undone. And I'm trusting that someone will let me know if I get off on my slides and not get to the end. Um, if humans have no separate existence, if we are completely entangled with the world, if we are no longer masters of the universe, then we are completely responsible to and for the world and all our relations of becoming with it. And this, this is in our research as well. We cannot ignore matter, for example our planet, as if it is inert, passive, and dead. It is completely alive, becoming with us, whether we destroy or protect it. Returning to the Facebook post questioning newness, while we might argue as to the origin of, of ideas and appropriation of ontological commitments without regard for different intellectual traditions, I do believe that an emphasis on ontological commitments and theorizing of, of with, in the new, whatever that may be, relinquishes our hold on the modernist knowledge project. With it comes a consideration of how we engage in inquiry and a recognition that the very questions we ask produce differing and different realities. Um, and I think this is true whether we say we ascribe to a new materialist or a new empiricist ontology or not. Our, the, way, the fact that we name things and, and study things and pose questions changes realities. <clears throat> it produces ontologies. Um, an example of this is to be found in the work of Ezekiel Dixon Roman and his discussion of how, quote, the apparatuses of measurement constitute the material conditions of what is possible and impossible. Um, and in Ezekiel's book, Inheriting Possibility, was just named the AERA Book of the Year Award. And it's quite an interesting um, text um, because he, he draws on Barad and Vicki Kirby and is looking and he's He's, he's challenging um, to use this binary division, quantitative researchers to look at how um, he, he does, he looks at SAT tests and things like this and how they produce particular realities and possibilities and talks about inheritance. So uh, especially if you're looking at a text that's, that's diving into that. There was also a special issue of cultural studies, critical methodologies a couple of years ago that was um, edited by uh, Liz DeFreitas, who I know was here a couple of weeks ago, um, and Ezekiel Dixon Roman and Patty Lather um, on, the new, on the ontology of numeracy. So again, if you've not looked at that special issue, I would encourage you to, to seek that out. All right, so in the spirit of this ontological turn, we might say that it's not that we have set the problems of this turn, but that as Brian explained, we quote, find ourselves in the midst of problems which function like imperatives to which we must respond, end quote. What is this midst in which we find ourselves? What are the conditions that compel us to attempt these turns? I argue that to a great extent, an ethical imperative is a condition driving these turns. History teaches us that ethics also drove important 20th century turns. <coughs> Excuse me. The emancipatory turn organized around the identity categories which enabled feminist, race-based, queer, social justice, and post-colonial critiques, liberatory critiques, aimed at combating oppression. The postmodern and post-structural turns were also deeply concerned with ethics in deconstructing and opening up oppressive material discursive structures. The 21st century has been saturated with ethical crises already. Um, on a small scale, psychologists certified by the American Psychological Association, the APA, 
advised the CIA on and supervised torture at Guantanamo. Um, APA has since revised its ethics policy, um, as if that stops these things. But <laughs> on a larger scale, millions of refugees flee their countries fearing torture, rape, famine, and death. And wealthy nation states refuse them, fearing the other who is too other. On a global scale, the Anthropocene, the newest geological era, scientifically confirms and marks the slow, creeping human impact on and destruction of our planet. What kind of existence have we created? What conditions have produced such a profound failure of ethics? Is it possible to imagine a different existence, a more ethical mode of being? How we think existence, the nature of being, ontology, is a profoundly ethical issue, one that becomes increasingly urgent. It is not surprising that ethical imperatives compel our curiosity. We have ample evidence that the existence we've created is not ethical, and the piling up of that evidence forces us to imagine a different existence. It is curiosity about what might be possible that enables us to imagine and create a different, more ethical existence. We made the existence we have. It is not natural. We can think and make another, and that is the task of ethical of experimentation. Another condition of this new work, and perhaps the most relevant in the context of this seminar series, is, as I mentioned earlier, a heightened curiosity and accompanying experimentation. Curiosity that, as Foucault wrote, can accomplish, quote, the critical work that thought brings to bear on itself, end quote, and can enable one to get free of oneself and refuse the existence we've been taught is real. Deleuze and Guattari, too, were interested in a different understanding of both thought and the nature of being. Deleuze proposed we create a new image of thought that refuses the dogmatic image of thought, such as the image Descartes used at the beginning of his meditations that Deleuze summarized as follows, quote, everybody naturally thinks that everybody is supposed to know implicitly what it means to think, end quote. Deleuze and Guattari encouraged us to think the unthought and to imagine, in their words, people that do not yet exist. People who, at least, don't destroy their planet in their mastery projects. So, my question to you, is there newness in new materialism? Perhaps not in being the first theoretical orientation to propose non-human agency, or being as relational. However, all of this newness and or oldness to return to indigenous thought, pragmatist thought, and assemblage theory presents an opportunity to unthink that which precedes us and which thereby propels us to consider some problems and overlook others. And I do think there are different questions that have been introduced into the, um, into the discussion as a result of um, feminist materialists, new materialists. It is with the idea of problems that I wish to proceed. While I subscribe to the above and the ethical imperative foregrounded by a call for entanglement, responsibility, and relationality, I wish to further extend my intention, attention to a discontinuity of matter, to that which exceeds the material, to the incorporeal, and this, I take this term from Elizabeth Gross, <clears throat> and what I'm calling a collective ontology. And with that, I'm going to get a cough drop. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Goodchild argued that the heart of Deleuze and Guattari's combined thought lies in an exploration of the possibilities of human relation, and here I emphasize the word relation. Goodchild wrote that this relation is concerned with a, and he, he said it thus, reconstruction of subjectivity, society, and environment. Deleuze and Guattari did not describe what life is, but rather what it does the forces that are acting through it along with its senses and values. This life or these forces are not that of a bounded organism or humanist subject, but, quote, the life that is not that of the bounded organism with its own life. That's Claire Colbrook's words. In other words, given the ontology presented by Deleuze and Guattari, I am no longer speaking of the bounded organism, a corporeal body, a humanist subject, but a post-humanist body that exists in a complex network of human and non-human forces. And if, any, if there are any of you in the audience that are reading Whitehead, we might, you might think about Whitehead's notion of an actual entity. 
Deleuze and Guattari use the concept body without organs <clears throat> to describe such an organism that is an assemblage of forces, desires, and intensities. I will return to this distinction shortly as I further extend that which I conceive of as a body or subject, and then I have being in parentheses, that exceeds the material. And this is what I, I'm interested in, at least today. Um, for, for Deleuze and Guattari, organs are not the enemies. They say, the enemy is the organism. The body without organs is opposed not to the organs, but to that organization of the organs called the organism. When they refer to the organism as the enemy, the point is that the organism demands structure and adherence to a whole. It is the organism that imposes form, that provides hierarchized organization that sediments and signifies a subject. They say this, the organism is a stratum on the body without organs. In geological terms, a stratum is a layer of sedimentary rock or soil with internally consistent characteristics that distinguish it from other layers. A geologist, I am not, but <clears throat> Deleuze and Guattari describe the stratum, stratum, stratum as, quote, a phenomena of accumulation, coagulation, and sedimentation that imposes upon the body without organs bonds, dominance, and hierarchized organization. In other words, the organism, in the form of a strata, prevents contamination or disruption of the organism. As the strata thicken and become solidified and sedimented, they coagulate to form an organism resistant to change. The organism is opposed to relation and excess. And we can think of an organism as a body, but I think an organism is not just a body, particularly if we're reading um, New Materialist Scholars, if we're reading Deleuze and Guattari. Conversely, the body without organs is nothing without relation and excess. If the body without organs describes a disarticulated, dismantled organism that is an assemblage of forces, desires, and intensities, then the collective, can we still refer to a subject? That's, my, that's one of my questions. Not reliant on the human being as the ontological unit of inquiry could be similarly thought to describe such an assemblage. This assemblage is further described by Deleuze and Guattari as a series of, quote, conjunctions, levels and thres thresholds, passages and distributions of intensity, end quote. The body without organs is not merely a disarticulated organism bound to the humanist subject, but pure collectivity on a plane of consistency. What the heck does that mean? Um, a plane, I'm doing my best to try to tease some of this out. A plane of consistency for Deleuze and Guattari is used to describe being, existence, as a process devoid of hier hierarchy and fixedness. Unlike the strata of the organism, a plane of consistency is a process of deterritorialization, re-territorialization, and change continuously. Such a conception of life, of being, of relation, and excess cannot be thought without thinking a collective. I will return to this idea of collectivity momentarily, but first I offer a reminder that an emergence of thought and subjectivity as this body without organs can only occur, according to Deleuze and Guattari, with signs and images that have never before appeared in the same way in the process of becoming. And so if you're new to reading Deleuze and Guattari, you know that they use words in a way that don't mean what we've come to think about them meaning, and they do that intentionally. And one of the great quotes is Deleuze talks about making language stutter. Because if we make language stutter, it means it arrests the way that we approach it um, as already knowing what it means, and we have to try to figure it out. <clears throat> in order to ground the above that I've just talked about in inquiry, I go to the problem of voice. To think with the problem of voice, I assert that it cannot be thought as emanating from an individual person, but as necessarily a collectivity. There is no separate individual person, no participant in an interview study, for example, to which a single voice can be linked. All are entangled. In Deleuze Guattarian ontology, there is no present, conscious, coherent individual who, as Maggie McClure has described, knows who she is, says what she means, and means what she says. Thus, I decouple voice, words spoken and written in transcripts, from an intentional, agentic, humanist subject, and move to voice without organs, 
voice, thought as an assemblage, a complex network of human and non-human agents that exceeds the traditional notion of the individual. Such voice, then, is voice not as an individual utterance, but voice as a collective. Just voice. Um, and I've written about this elsewhere. I know some of you maybe have read that, but if not, I'm happy to share some resources. Um, I will provide an example of what I'm talking about in the next section, but first more to how I am thinking about the collective. In thinking voice as a collective, giving way to a collective ontology, I look to gestures found in the writings of Foucault and Deleuze with Guattari. When Foucault discussed the implications for analysis that his archaeological method presented, he wrote not about the importance of describing what men thought of sexuality, nor how certain behaviors might be represented, but rather about discursive practices, fields of possible enunciations, and murmurs of intentions. Those are words, those are phrases that Foucault used none of which, I would argue, adhere to a voice of a humanist subject. Similarly, Deleuze and Guattari were more forceful when they asserted there is no individual enunciation. There is not even a subject of enunciation. They continue to emphasize that, quote, enunciation in itself implies collective assemblages, what they refer to elsewhere as collective assemblages of enunciation. <clears throat> Deleuze and Guattari discussed the problem of expression in both A Thousand Plateaus and Kafka Toward a Minor Literature. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm drawing more heavily on the Kafka book, um, but they talk about this in both places. In A Thousand Plateaus, Deleuze and Guattari described how a writer is invented by an assemblage at the very moment when, in the moment of originality, he or she is inventing and being invented. That which we consider as the most original type of utterance, the literary utterance, is always the product of a collective assemblage of enunciation. <clears throat> this is why Deleuze and Guattari are able to claim, quote, there are no individual statements, only statement producing machinic assemblages. They continued, each of us is caught up in an assemblage <clears throat> and we reproduce its statements when we think we are speaking in our own name or rather we speak in our own name when we produce its statement. I just had this thought just flew into my head. I know you've all said it's like, oh, I sound like my mother or my father, or you say things and it's like, where did, where did that come from? Or you write something and you go back and read it and think, I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> Further ballast for the idea of a collective is found in their development of a, what they name a minor literature. <clears throat> in naming the minor literature, Three characteristics are presented by Deleuze and Guattari as differentiating a minor literature from a major language, and the major language is the hegemonic dominant language. The first is that a minority constructs a minor literature within a major language, affecting that language with a high coefficient of deterritorialization. Within language, deterritorialization unsettles habitual uses, usages of language that sediment thought. They write about order words too and how words that function as order words you know, produce a thinking in a particular way. A major language is hegemonic, thereby re-territorializing by exerting a gravitation, gravitational pull of sameness. The second characteristic is that everything in a minor literature is political. The individual concern is not confined to the individual, but allied with the collective. All things, all individuals, all stories are claimed in a territory of connection. There are no discrete individual subjects that narrate or can be narrated apart from the collective. The third characteristic, characteristic of a minor literature is that in it, all things assume a collective value. There are, and this is the, the, their words again, there are no possibilities for an individuate, individuated enunciation. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Interesting that I'm talking about voice, huh? <laughs> All things, all individuals, all stories are claimed in a territory of connection. Oh, I think I'm repeating. The third characteristic, sorry, of a minor literature is that in it all things assume a collective. There are no possibilities for an individual enunciation. All things are in and of the assemblage. They also explain that in a minor literature, quote, every statement is the product of a machinic assemblage. In other words, of collective assemblages of enunciation, <clears throat> end quote. While I have developed the three characteristics more fully in another paper, 
and offered a methodological intervention in what I have named a minor inquiry, for my purposes this afternoon, I will focus on the third characteristic, that of collective assemblages of enunciation. And this is a, a bit of a long quote from Deleuze and Parnett, but it's an important quote. In an assemblage, <clears throat> there are no singulars, only connectives. The individual speaker speaks from the collective assemblage. I'm going to provide an, uh, an example in a little bit, and I think th thinking about this quote when I get to the example might be helpful. The minimum real unit is not the words, the idea, the concept of the signifier, but the assemblage. It is always an assemblage which produces utterances. Utterances do not have as their cause a subject which would act as a subject of enunciation any more than they are related to subjects as subjects of utterance. The utterance is the product of an assemblage, what is always, which is always collective, which brings into play within us and outside us populations, multiplicities, territories, becomings, affects, events. I even think about this drumming at the beginning. I mean, we had two individuals, and yet they're it's not just the two individuals, it's the histories, it's the voices, it's the land, it's us. And so I think that's an, also an interesting way to think about. And it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very material thing, and yet that which sort of escapes the material, which is not present here, is, is what I think I'm trying to, to get at. Okay, so in a minor literature, Deleuze and Guattari wrote that everything takes on a collective value. There isn't a subject, there are only collective assemblages of enunciation. No longer beginning with a subject who speaks with a voice, the utterance as noted above can only speak of the whole that constitutes it. This whole, this experience is spoken and stands in for a truth. Um, and I'm going to mispronounce his name because my French is very bad. Le Cirque? Le Cirque? C L E C E R C L E Le Cercle Le Cercle C E R C L E Le Cercle. Thank you. Um, he he, on the other hand, describes the utterance as quote not merely the locus of a speech act, a promise, for instance, but of a social act, in that utterances are collective assemblage of enunciation, that mixture of bodies, instruments, institutions, and utterances which speaks the speaker. That's the end of the quote from him. That is, the utterance is not simply spoken words emanating from a conscious subject, but is inseparable from all elements, human, non-human, more than human, in an assemblage, the example we were just talking about with the drumming. Utterances are one part of an assemblage that includes multiple heterogeneous elements, both material and discursive, objects, signs, physical acts, utterances, bodies. If all utterances are of a collective nature, the possibility of inquiry that relies on a participant to give an account is no longer thinkable, which is, of course, the assumption that grounds conventional qualitative methodology. It is not that individual bodies disappear, but the importance we attach to speech acts linked to those specific bodies is diminished. According to Todd May, he asks this question, or he states this, one way to approach Deleuze and Guattari's politics is to see them as offering a new political ontology. Why should we assume that individual human beings are the proper ontological units for an IAD inquiry? Is it possible to start with some other unit? A Deleuzean and new materialist ontology provides a shift away from the individual as the unit of inquiry to inquiry that presupposes the subject as a relational process, a collective. If the subject is a relational process, then the voice of a discrete subject is no longer something to be retrieved to provide an account of a participant's experience. Instead, it emerges through relationality. That is, individual elements in the assemblage are not single sources of knowledge or existence. Following the contours of Deleuze and Guattari's politics, collectivity emerges. No longer an account of an individual being constrained by a body, a space, a time, or an individual utterance. Voice, and by extension being, is an entanglement of all of these relations. So I want to talk then about material excesses in this section. Um, in her book, The Incorporeal, Ontology, Ethics, and the Limits of Materialism, Elizabeth Gross describes materialism 
as, quote, commonly aligned with empiricist forms of knowledge, knowledge based on generalizations from bodily or perceptual observations, however technologically mediated, end quote. Performing a genealogy of what she describes as the incorporeal, the subsistence of the ideal in the material or corporeal, she seeks, and she, she describes it thus, she seeks forms of materialism that refuse to abandon idealism, a way of thinking the inherence of ideality in materiality, a paradoxical position only to the extent that it refuses the binarization, the inherent gap, the mutually exclusive and exhaustive relation between matter and ideal." End quote. Critical of a materialism that fails to complicate the very idea of materialism, she poses a series of challenges in the form of questions, some of which I present here for our consideration. And she has more than four, but I just, oh, you can't read that very well, can you? Can you see it? All right. Um, but I just chose four because I think they speak maybe more closely to the example that I'm going to use. <clears throat> so the first question, what is it that materialism must assume without being able to acknowledge as material? What must materialism assume? What terms must it develop in order for it to explain what appears to be immaterial or extra material? I think that's, that's the question I think that I'm, well, that one and the next one that I'm wrestling with right now. How do materialists understand meaning or sense in terms beyond their materiality as sonorous or written trace? How can sense in both its senses as meaning and as orientation be possible without some direction in matter itself? I offer the following example that provokes for me sense and collectivity in that which appears to be immaterial or extra material. <clears throat> March for our lives is a movement dedicated to student-led activism toward ending gun violence and the epidemic of mass shootings in U.S. schools. It emerged as a response to the February 14, 2018 school massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, in which 17 people were killed and 17 more wounded. On March 24, 2018, the March for Our Lives was held in Washington, D.C., and at 800 plus sibling marches across the globe, including Vancouver, as I understand. <clears throat> During her time on the March for Our Lives stage, Emma Gonzalez, 18, who has been one of the most prominent of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas survivor activists, allotted herself six minutes and 20 seconds for her speech. The amount of time she noted that it had taken for Nicholas Cruz to slaughter 17 of her schoolmates and injure many more. No one could comprehend the devastating aftermath or how far this would reach or where this would go, Gonzalez said. For those who still can't comprehend because they refuse to, I'll tell you where it went, right into the ground, six feet deep. Gonzalez then listed her slain classmates by name, a tragic poem read to and for America, each line representing a life cut short. Six minutes and 20 seconds with an AR-15, Gonzalez said, and my friend Carmen would never complain to me again about piano practice. There were many more no mores. Gina Montalto will never wave to her friend Liam at lunch, Gonzalez said. Joaquin Oliver will never play basketball with Sam or Dylan. Elena Petty would never. Kara Lof Lofgren would never. Chris Hickson would never. Luke Hoyer would never. Martine Duke Angiano would never. Peter Wang would never. Elisa Aldehoff would never. Jamie Gutenberg would never. Meadow Pollock would never. And then Gonzalez stopped talking. For a moment, and then another one, and another. She breathed, she cried, she stared at the crowd and at the cable news camera, transmitting it all to the world, her face marked with both sadness and defiance. She was giving them dead air in every sense. She knew it. She knew, too, that the cameras would not turn away. Gonzalez kept the silence, continuous, insistent, until six minutes and 20 seconds were up. And if you, the Guardian had the full um, duration of her speech on their website, you can, you can view it. And, and literally, there is, there's probably at least four and a half minutes of silence, um, and, and you, and at one point someone comes up to her and then her phone, she had set an alarm so she knew exactly how, you know, it was, it was intentional and planned. She knew exactly when the time would be up. <clears throat> um, 
I started to show that today, but I, I was I didn't I didn't know how I felt about doing that. So um, so that's that's the, the this is the example. And while many high-profile performers took to the stage as part of the march in Washington D.C. to make noise and call attention to the political power of noise and of bodies, it was the silence that was the most striking. Silence that I'm arguing was a collective enunciation of bodies, tears, lives, existences, beyond materiality as sonorous or written trace. The six minutes and 20 seconds, mostly of silence, while seemingly empty, was full of materiality, language, and filled with a trace of those assembled in DC, those assembled worldwide, those victims of gun violence, and those breathing as the silence reverberated a collective enunciation as it spoke the speaker. The Silent Speech Act exceeded sense beyond or in excess of materiality. It is not something that could be touched, tamed, or located, and yet it is this excess that is, was, the always, already, the trace, emerging through the collective. And I think this is where you might be thinking, well, she's not talking about materialism, and yet I think I am because of, of this, it necessitates the collective and the relationality and, and, and the interaction with things that aren't things that we can name necessarily. <clears throat> This question of sense beyond materiality haunts me as I return again and again to the above account. And it is telling to me that I think of haunting, as you will see in a minute. What is it about this silence, this marking of time, that functions not as a gap or an emptiness, but as a collective enunciation of a becoming broader than a being, an individuation that is more encompassing than any individual or individual speech act? Might we say of an expression of the incorporeal? The trace for Derrida puts into question the idea of presence, and this is where haunting comes in. <laughs> what we privilege in traditional empirical research is presence as evidence of, is presence as evidence of being. To think being beyond materiality, as we are urged by Elizabeth Gross's questions, might be to take us back to Derrida to think a materiality or excess of materiality present in a seeming absence. Considering Gonzalez's speech, the collective spoken as silence, <clears throat> that which precedes the silence is present in the silence. <coughs> Excuse me. In everything, there is the trace, a haunting of the always, already absent presence. In Vicki Kirby's rereading of Derrida, nothing is outside text. And this nothing in the form of Gonzales, dead silence is teeming with a non-material materiality. And I have one more page, and I thought I was going to make it without coughing, but it seems that I'm not. Some silence will be good. <laughs> in the conclusion of The Incorporeal, Gross recaps the mapping that she has presented in the book. In conducting what she referred to as a genealogy of the incorporeal, she has engaged the work of a series of philosophers who have attempted to problematize the relationship between the mind or ideality and body or materiality as separate without resorting to a resolution that results in what she describes as a reductionism in which one term, usually, usually ideality, is reduced to or explained by and as the other, in other words, materiality. She continues with the following understanding of the incorporeal that is an emergence from <clears throat> and an entwinement with materiality and ideality. And I'm going to turn this off for one second. Oh, there it goes. All right. The incorporeal is the dimension of ideality that suffuses all things, enabling them to signify and generate representations. <clears throat> I've claimed that there is always already something in the organization of matter, matter at its most elementary, that, cons that contains the smallest but perhaps most significant elements of ideality. When Gross poses the question, what must materialism assume 
What terms must it develop in order for it to explain what appears to be immaterial or extramaterial? I do not have a ready answer at hand, but I believe that there is purchase in a collective ontology expressed in the above example that is an emergence from and an entwinement with materiality and ideality. And there are many other examples. So in conclusion, I began with a quote, quote from Clara Colebrook that to refer to materiality is to go beyond what is simply given and to consider the process by which it comes into being or actuality. This seems to me in keeping with Elizabeth Gross's project and that which I have attempted to develop in this talk. <clears throat> if we are to approach materiality or the material in inquiry as that which is given or that which can be observed or even that with which we interact, we remain stuck in an old model of empiricism in which knowledge of the empirical world gained through the senses is the only knowledge that is legitimate and which orders our thinking about possible relations and as yet to be thought ontologies. I think this also holds true for those who say that they are doing new work but fail to account for that which escapes capture. In a return to the beginnings of this seminar series, I think it fitting to provide a quote by the first speaker, Iris van der Tuen, from her edited work with Rick, Rick Dolphine, in which they wrote, it is in the resonances between old and new readings and re-readings that a new metaphysics might announce itself. A new metaphysics is not restricted to a here and now, nor does it merely project an image of the future for us. It announces what we may call a, quote, new tradition which simultaneously gives us a past, a present, and a future. Thus, a new metaphysics does not add something to thought, a series of ideas that wasn't there, that was left out by others. It rather traverses and thereby rewrites thinking as a whole, leaving nothing untouched, redirecting every possible idea according to its new sense of orientation. And this is from the, the book that they edited together and the, had the interviews with... Um, Karen Broad, and we were talking about this last night and couldn't remember who the fourth person was. But I surprised myself when in the writing of this talk, I found myself returning to Derrida and the concept of trace, rupture, footprint. Those of you who know anything of my intellectual history may know that I began my career thinking with Derrida to theorize silence as voice, voice that escapes capture exceeding the material. I welcome your questions, comments, and musings as I return to problems and texts that continue to offer possibilities for thinking a collective ontology in the new. Thank you. So shall I? Oh, well, however you want to do it. I was just wondering if I should shut the slides off or no, you can leave them up. just leave it. Okay. Oh. No, 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 no. Okay. That's all right. I'm going to use the microphones here. Oh, all right. Okay. It seems like the major language mm -hmm. has two of those things, right? It has, it's always political as well, and it's always collective. And so maybe the real difference is that there's an attempt to use words differently or to use yeah, I mean, I think, yes, it's always, pol it's always political, but I think to talk about the collective, there's a collective, but it's not a collective in the sense that, that the collective is the, in is the individual, that the collective is made up of discrete individuals rather than a collective that is reliant upon these relations between individuals. So I think that is one difference. Um, and the... <clears throat> Um, I mean, the first one is the is the deterritorialization and reterritorialization, and so so part of what you know part of what the organism does is it, it allows escape, but then it always 
there's always this capture. Um, and so I, th I, I think that part of it is that that these others may be present, but that the, the understanding of collective is very different. The, 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 the relationality is very different. And that it's also, their, their concept is that the minor, the minor language is, comes from within, but, but, it's a, but it's a refusal's too strong. It's a, it's a refusal to adhere to maybe the signs as they are understood in the major language. That's maybe a, a bad short answer, but we could talk about that some more later. <clears throat> Do you have a question? I was waiting just... at someone, sorry. Wait, wait. I was waiting. That was my fault. I have a and I am halfway through Elizabeth but so thinking about the incorporeal incorporeality, um, science is a good example. In um, I was trying to use this concept uh, in describing one scene from you know from my story that I'm, I'm writing about, and I'm thinking about incorporeality as circulating. Um, in, in, in this uh, uh, procession, mm. we were going through a procession, right? Mm -hmm. uh, always the same stuff, and, uh, and, and so I was thinking about the corporeality there, floating in between. Mm -hmm. what, what was uh, bringing us all together? So, it, uh, in, in a way, my question is very personal here. So, it's like, uh, would that be the corporeality? Well, I, I think I, I, I think I want to res I want to resist saying this is what it is, but I think what I think part of what she's doing, and this is where you know I'm not I'm not a classically trained philosopher, um, but what she's what she what she starts with is the is the philosophical orientation of idealism versus realism and how how we come to. To, to know what we know and what, and what we privilege. But I think that what, what you're describing is, uh, part of what I want to do is to expand the way that we think about what constitutes the material. Now, this is not, an, this is not my idea necessarily. I, I made reference to Vicki Kirby. And in her book, Quantum Anthropologies, she, she's, re, she's rereading, I think she's, in some ways, I read it as an apology. She's writing an apologetic for Derrida um, and trying to say that you know, when, well, when Derrida, of course, first of all, he was misunderstood when he said there's nothing outside text. He didn't literally mean there's nothing outside words. Um, that text is text is much broader than that. I mean, the, the the actual printed words would be in the form of a book. The text, and and so what she wants to do is say, well, what if we think about the world as text? How then do we reread what he had to say? And I think, had he lived longer, um, had Foucault lived longer, I think that. I think that we can look at their writing, both of their writings, and think about how, how they were maybe not talking about the body or materiality in the way that we are thinking about it now, but certainly I think there's something there that they were trying to think about. Um, you know, Derrida goes back to, um, he, he rereads the, the, the Western canon as a way of trying to push, push it in different directions. Um, so, so back to this idea of the procession, and, and I mean, I think that example is could be thought similarly in the way that we were thinking about the drumming and the idea of the, of the ancestors and the presence, and, and what does something have to physically be present to have a have a materiality about it? Um, that's what I'm trying to think about. <clears throat> yeah. Like the, the idea of multiplicity and the, the virtual, actual sort of uh, take on that could also be another way of describing mm. incorporeal. Because a, if we go back to your example of the silence, I think part of what's uh, not there and there at mm -hmm. the same time is what didn't get actualized mm -hmm. during that four mm -hmm. minutes. And that's what we think of. Do we think of like the other names? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
it, in the sense that the virtual isn't there, but it's real. It has that sense of being material. And mm -hmm. material. Yeah, that's a, I mean, the, well, and the virtual is all that is possible, right. and that the actual comes out of the virtual, and so that yeah, that's an interesting way to think about it. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that part of what she does, I mean, she looks at, she starts with the Stoics. Mm -hmm. Oh, Gross does. And then she goes next to um, Spinoza, which, as we know, were very influential with Deleuze. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that, that that's probably, I mean, I, I don't know that it's the same, but I think it's like these, I think there's some, inter, I think there's some definite intersections there. But, yeah, the virtual and actual is a really good one to think about. And of course, there are a lot of material feminists who are very much influenced by the work of Deleuze and Guattari. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could speak a bit about methodology and what the sure. um, concept of the collective voice means for us as researchers. Sure. So, um, part of what I think it means is how do we. So, let me give a couple of examples <clears throat> one from my work and one from a student whose work I'm supervising. <clears throat> so I'm from the southeast region of the United States. I'm from the Appalachian region. I don't know if you all know anything about Appalachia, but it's very um, historically and still very impoverished part of the country, um, heavily dependent on coal mining. The people there are considered to be very backward and um, ignorant and clannish and all sorts of derogatory things. So that's my history. My mother's family, my mother, m many of my uncles and my um, grandfather, they were coal miners. My mother grew up in coal camp, so there's that. So now I live in Oregon, west, you know, western, northwest part of the United States. So a couple of years ago, there was a scholar um, visiting our campus. And he was meeting, we had lunch, some of the faculty in our department, and, um, and this is a scholar who does very, um, very interesting work, um, I would say very socially responsible work in terms of um, youth in South Central LA. So the superintendent for the local school district was in this meeting, and so you've got Eugene and you've got Springfield, and they're almost like one community, but there's, a, there's like this demarcation. And so the visiting scholar asked the su this su associate superintendent, well, tell me about your, the school district. And he, he described the school district as spring tucky. That was the word he used. One word, spring tucky. And I'm sitting there, and nobody kind of bats an eye. As, well, it's, it was in reference to Kentucky. So it's this whole regional thing. So I start thinking about what is it about this naming that is everybody else in the room sort of knew what he meant, nodded, but I'm also thinking about the way in which this functions as a, maybe it doesn't function as a collective enunciation, but it functions to, to then produce this group of students in a particular way. And so um, if we just think about this utterance as being spoken by this person about this particular group of students, we could isolate it and say, oh, well, you know, he's ignorant or he's this or he's that. But what I started trying to do then was write a narrative <clears throat> that is not located in an individual or in a place or um, with a particular group of students and say, what if, what if, what if we think about this as, as some kind of a collective then the implications are much greater than just this one incident. Um, I also did try to do a similar thing with um, one of the, with some of the, with the transcript from the women, uh, the first generation academic women. And what, what if we take this, okay, these are the words that Fran spoke. But what if it's not just about what Fran spoke? What if it's how this connects to other women and these other experiences in rural life? And that it becomes this, that it is a collective, not that it becomes a collective, that it is a collective. Um, <clears throat> so that's one couple of examples. So the student that I'm working with, and I talked about this last night, she, um, she did a year-long ethnography 
of a student success initiative at a large university. And I don't know if you all have those in Canada. I hope you don't. But, um, I mean, this comes out of higher ed literature. And it is um, how do we increase graduation rates? How do we improve our efficiency? But the measure is, so it's called a student success initiative, but the measure is four-year four year completion rate. Okay. So she does this ethnography, and what she decided is she's not presenting what this administrator said or that staff person said or how it worked. She's presenting the whole thing as a, the, at least the one of her findings chapters is a, as a collective enunciation. And so looking at this, this not, as an, not as this study of this particular institution or this initiative, but how it is you know, plugging into the, the um, she did a genealogy first of the higher ed literature, so where are we now in terms of what are considered best practices? And she actually created a couple of um, figures that are, these are words that people spoke, but it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter that this, is, this person said it, this is how this machine is producing and reproducing itself. So that, that's an example of how, how do we think about why does it matter, <clears throat> I guess the, the big question, for, why does it matter who said what? I think what matters is what, what, gets, what happens, what happens to students. And she, she also, in this chapter, talks about the fact that we're not talking about individuals, we're talking about individuals. And so d this, this initiative erases difference. And so why should we, she doesn't say it in this way, why do we care about who said things if we don't care about the individuals? The only thing we care about is, is the metric and the measure. So more on that. I know a couple of you are going to be at ICQI. A couple of you. She's going to be at ICQI. I'll introduce you. That, does that help answer your question? Okay. Um, I'm thinking about your example, and I'm thinking about my supervisor who is a historian. Mm -hmm. And I think she would argue that historians have been doing that for a long time. Uh, she goes on to call mm -hmm. to uh, talk about the history of education mm -hmm. or the history of childhood. Mm -hmm. And what I found in the historical work is that they start from an example, like mm -hmm. you said. And they start to do this genealogy mm -hmm. and plug in mm -hmm. all these elements to we, she would say, the discourse, the discursive practice mm -hmm. behind it. Mm -hmm. So I wonder uh, if, is there any difference between this historical mm -hmm. work with the work that we have been talking about? I, I think so, because I think it's, we're talking about, in, I mean, that's why I started with talking about the empirical. Because we're not looking at, I'm not looking at historical documents. Well, in the sense of the student, she's looking at the historical documents to, that, that was her literature review. That's how she did, she did her literature review as a genealogy. <coughs> Just to say, this is the, you know, this is the epoch that we are now occupying. This is how we, this, this is how success came to be defined in this way. But then she's doing field work. And so I think the difference is that it's, it's still in the context of, work in the field of some sort. Um, I th that, I think, is the, is the major difference. Um, and I think that this other work informs the way we approach a problem or a question. But then we're, but then we're going into schools, or we're going into um, <clears throat> higher ed institutions, or we're going into prisons, or we're going to wherever it is that we're, then we're doing our field work. Was there another question? I thought I saw a hand in the back. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, not quite the last. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there yes. you Thank you very much for the talk. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if I recall exactly, but at the beginning you said, is it still important to talk about a subject if we're talking about what mm -hmm. is it? It's not a lot of mm -hmm. Do you think the language of subjectification is still a useful language in the context of these forces going mm -hmm. into yeah, I mean, I think what I said is, can we still? Um, but I also do question the emphasis that we put on 
See, and I get, I mean, it's not that I don't get blowback about this from students and other colleagues, but I think that if we focus, we focus so much on the individual, we've been doing that for a long time, and we then we don't, we lose sight of how that individual is not just an independent, I mean, it's, it's a critique of enlightenment, that whatever I do is not just whatever I do. Whatever I do is, is contingent upon and produced as um, by these different relations and sources and so forth. Um, the fact that I grew up where I grew up, the fact that I've lived where I've lived, the fact that I have had access to things um, means that I make certain choices that I'm able to make that I would not be able to make. Or, I mean, we could get into the argument of whether I'm, I'm, and I'm not saying that people don't make choices because I think we're, we're all agents, human and non, you know, human, non-human, more than human. But, but this idea of relationality then is, a, is calling into question the, the independence of such, of such choice. And so I think part of, what I, part of what I want to move away from or what I want to challenge is, particularly in the context of talking about education that is, you know, trying to ameliorate um, bad situations, that's trying to look at that um, oppressive situations. If we just focus on individuals, we're not going to change the way we, we can't solve the problem. Um, trying to think of the words. We, we can always find the example of someone, okay, here's, this is it, maybe. Resilience and grit, that's also a big thing in the US right now. Okay, well, we can, all, we can point out individuals who succeeded and then we can say, well, you know, this individual succeeded, why, why didn't you? Well, because it's not just about what individuals do. Um, so we, we do have subjects, but I, but I think the subject in a very different way, or I, I think that's, that's, what this, that's, that's what this theoretical train does. Huh. Oh, yes. I was reading your article on coming over. Sorry, I was working. Mm. And what about Amanda and her husband and his mm. But I'm fascinated, and I'd love to hear you again, how you, as a researcher coming in, mm -hmm. I'm a museum educator, but you, you still, even though I understand your idea, <coughs> it's not the subject, but that's kind of connected to science of Azerbaijan mm -hmm. pronunciation. But you come in as a researcher and meeting with that person, mm -hmm. you created that space. Of, a, of specific kind of encounters, mm -hmm. you created that temporary as of that, and you you maybe prompt and, and create that possibilities of creating those spaces mm -hmm. for you to think. So I think that meeting people mm -hmm. remain of, always important. Oh, definitely. Um, I'm not saying to do away with the field work or <laughs> to do away with talking to people. I mean, that's how we that's how we interact. That's how we communicate. But what I, what I really want to push against is the way in which we try to attach significance to individual utterances as if they can provide us with a truth. And that I think there's, there's much more richness to be found if we look at these utterances as a, as a product of this collective. Um, the Student Success Initiative, it's, it's really quite shocking some of the things people say. But what's even more interesting is how these things are said in a context in which some people don't find it shocking at all because of how the conversations are produced. And so um, for, I think it's just, it's another, I mean, this goes back to the methodology question. It's how do, we, how do we try to make some sense or produce a different set of questions of, of what is happening? Um, because the way we've tried to keep asking the same questions hasn't necessarily moved the needle. <laughs> um, and so, and I think the other thing that you just said that I think is important for me to, to clarify, I don't see what this work does is about creating the assemblage. I think it's about trying to maybe analyze using that, using that lens. Um, Ian Buchanan wrote, uh, I don't know if any of you know Ian Buchanan's work, and he can be quite snarky sometimes, but in a good way. Um, but he has a piece that appeared 
within, I think it was last year in the um, Deleuze Studies Journal. And part of what he's doing is he's critiquing social science folks who try to create assemblages rather than use it as an analytical tool. So I think that's, that's part of what I'm trying to think about is how do, we, how do we use this as our analytic tool to look at the way these, these relations and these connections. Does that answer your question? Well, you don't think that, that you meet your uh, people and if you create some kind of temporary Yes. Mm -hmm. And then they produce something? Well, I mean, this, this is maybe where I think Barad is a little more helpful for me, when she talks about cuts, making cuts. And so as a researcher, I'm always making cuts. Um, and when I make a cut, and she talks about cutting together and cutting apart, I make a cut, I decide I'm going to interview you, and, that, and, and so there was some place I wrote about this, and I tried to say, you know, trying to be upfront or transparent about recognizing the cuts that I'm making because I, as you say, I am choosing to interview you. I'm, I'm developing these questions and so forth. But then there are also cuts that are, other cuts that are being made, some of which I'm aware and some of which I'm not. Um, so she's a little bit more helpful to me in terms of thinking about that. But I think your question is, we can't just say, well, it's, it's all here and it's happening and these things are, are um, coming together because we are, we are part of that coming together. Um, and that's where I think Ezekiel's book that I mentioned earlier is, he's, he's saying that when we, when we measure something, we're, produ we're producing an outcome. And um, a lot of researchers who deal with large data act as if they don't have to think about these questions because they're not encountering individuals in the same way that we are who are doing qualitative work. <clears throat> Good. Thanks. Thank you for your questions, and I'd like to thank you uh -huh. on behalf of all of us by offering you oh. this talking stick, and I have some thank notes you. about it that I'd like to refer to oh. and kindly offered to me from uh, Margaret. Mm -hmm. And the talking <coughs> stick uh, is a symbol of power in First Nations cultures, mm -hmm. and it attributes um, it attributes the right to speak to a speaker, um, and it was designed by a local uh, First Nations carver out of yellow cedar. Oh. Um, hmm. His name is Jim Yelton, and he lives in Squamish. And it's carved in the shape of a whale, and the whale is known to help people hmm. whenever they're in need or helpless or wounded, and it's also the guardian of the sea. Um, and of travel and a symbol of unity and and whales travel also in families and collectives oh. um, and and they work together like wolves do and they're also known as sea wolves and hmm. so we're very happy to have you here and to be able to share this with you thank you and, and so you can also use it when you speak I will thank you and I'm honored to have this thank you very much